Decoupling. Is it a euphemistic phrase for divorce? Is it what railway car carriages do? Or is it the United States economy untangling itself from the sinking economies of Japan and Europe, grabbing a surfboard and riding the wave of reflation onto a nice beach where they're going to have a Mai Tai or a mojito? Let's find out. We're going to ask Jeff Snyder, head of global research of Alhambra Investments. You can find him on Twitter at Jeff Snyder underscore AIP. Jeff, we're going to turn to another article about Japan that'll then segue into Europe and the United States. The first one we're turning to is called Deflation Returns to Japan, Part 2, posted November 20th at the Alhambra Investments blog. Uh, the same day that the inflation figures were released in Part 1 that we were discussing, that's a government measure of the economy. There's a private measure of the economy called the Purchasing Manager Indices. And this asks the manufacturing and service managers and then how they're doing. And then it puts a composite score together. And what did we learn from Jibun Bank about the state, the outlook actually, the outlook. These are forward-looking indicators of the Japanese economy. Well, the, what the, the uh, purchasing manager index has shown for the ever since March, even going back before March, and I think that's an important point too, is that the Japanese economy has been in recession for a long, long time already. And despite the, you know, somewhat of a comeback since March in Japan as well, elsewhere, it never really got out of that contraction phase, at least in terms of the PMI, it never got above 15. And you can never take the 50 level too literally. But, you know, it was sufficiently below 50, substantially below 50 enough that you would think, okay, Japan's really struggling here. And really struggling here in a way, as we just talked about in part one, that doesn't have as much to do with COVID and the coronavirus. The economy is really struggling and it hasn't, you know, it's come back a bit from the bottom, but it really not come back much at all. And then we come to find out in October, things got a lot worse. Uh, these Both the service, the service sector more than the manufacturing sector, but both sectors really took a turn for the worse in October. That that's corroborates in a lot of, in a, in a very big sense, the uh, deflationary numbers in Japanese CPI, which says demand is not coming back. Uh, producers as well as service providers are having to discount the prices on their goods and services. And the deflationary mindset, which never really left, is now, t is now uh, in, into an uh, even higher level of disruption and, di and dysfunction. That's right. So these purchasing manager indices are diffusion indexes. And if a score of 50, you could look at it as saying that an equal number of people said the economy was getting better, getting worse, and not changing. So if you're below 50, then you have more people saying, more managers are saying employment prices, orders are getting worse. The services number was 46.7. The previous month, it was 47.7, so one point lower. The composite number was also one point lower. It came in at 47. Manufacturing, not as bad, as you pointed out, 48.3 versus 48.7 in the previous month. The point here I wanted to make, and normally I never say or care what the expectations are, the analyst forecast unless the analyst forecast is in the wrong direction. And the analyst forecast was for the number to come in at 49.4 for growth. It went the other way, 48.3. Yeah, that's a lot about um, not just Japan, but the rest of the world. The, the world economy, I think, has stumbled uh, significantly since we've been talking about it since June and July. But it may be that the, the things are starting to roll over again September and into October and maybe even to, into November as we've seen in the United States, at least with jobless claims and things like that. So the rebound that was, that was supposed to have taken place since around May when, you know, the economy, uh, global economy, many parts of it started to reopen, that did happen. There was a rebound, but it wasn't a complete rebound. More and more what we're seeing, especially, you know, Japan being a, a leading indicator, a bellwether, whatever you want to call it, we're seeing that the rebound kind of stopped, never really got going. It, you know, there was something, it, it wasn't complete. It wasn't fully, you know, there wasn't enough momentum with it. It was just reopening. There was no economic processes with it, whatever, whatever you want to say, something kept the rebound from becoming a recovery. The rebound happened, but it stopped way short of 
recovery. And now that, that, that the more time that goes on where we don't have the completed rebound into recovery, that creates the opportunity for bad things to begin to st- start happening again, for negative factors to creep in. And that's where you get into not just the recession, because we're already in a recession, but a prolonged recession, which, you know, that's the worst of the worst cases. Prolonged recessions, recessions with no upside, I like to call depressions. For the audience that didn't catch uh, episode 36, David Parkins, our illustrator, put together something fantastic that illustrates exactly what Jeff was just talking about. The difference between rebound, reflation, and recovery. And so he had a, he had a roulette wheel, and normally you've got 36 numbers on there, and they're all equally spaced. He had this one long section that was rebound. We had the rebound. And that was about 60% of the wheel. Then about 35% of the wheel is reflation. So reflation is that rally back towards the number you were before the recession started. And then a small traditional slot, 5% in size of the whole wheel is recovery, where you can reacquire that pre-recessionary trend. So if the picture is worth a thousand words, David Parkin's illustration for episode 36 is a must see. Jeff, you were talking about that Japan is reflecting what the whole world is experiencing. And wouldn't you know it, Monday, November 23rd, we got PMI estimates for the euro area. And they were preliminary, so flash estimates, so it's not final. IHS market produced some numbers for us. Jeff, do you know what they were off the top of your head, or does it not really matter, just the direction? What did we learn about Europe? The European PMIs were atrocious. <laughs> it doesn't really matter what the exact numbers. I think the, the composite was something like 45, or maybe the service was, whatever. Well, there, were, right. there was one that was down in around 45, which is, I mean, that's, that's the opposite of what you want to see in a rebound recovery situation. In fact, it was a deep retrenchment. Now, in Europe, you can say, well, yeah, that's, that's governments reimposing restrictions and lockdowns, and, and, and that's, some of that's true. But we also have to keep in mind that Europe was in a recession like Japan before COVID ever showed up, and it didn't really rebound much after it, during, well, during, where other places had during the uh, post-March, post-May uh, period, too. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they were already in recession. The economy was already weak. An economy that is weak is going to have trouble rebounding. It's going to have trouble recovering because of all the processes or all the negative factors that are, that are forcing it into recession in the first place, especially if those factors have never been significantly or sufficiently dealt with. So the European economy is deeply retrenching as we head closer to the end of this year and into next year, and that's already starting to be reflected in the Japanese economy. So we have a couple good leading indications that remind us of the way things happened in 2018, leading up to this pre-COVID recession, where we saw in early 2018, right off the bat in 2018, you know, Japan and Germany in particular, suddenly this is as if their their economic recoveries, which which were supposed to be, you know, this massively inflationary, accelerating, globally synchronized growth of 2017. Instead, they go into 2018 and immediately uh, Germany's in contraction, as is Japan. So Germany and Japan went first in the 2018-2019 period. And so in some ways, bringing this back to where we started, we're revisiting in 2020 what we already revisited in 2018, which is the idea that maybe the U.S. economy can decouple from everyone else, which is already ironic because decoupling in its original economic sense goes back to uh, the early parts of 2008 when many people said, oh, the U.S. is screwed, maybe the rest of the world can decouple from the U.S. And so it's every time we have these downturns show up in recessions, decoupling always comes up in them, at least in the first parts of them, because the, globally, the global economy, when it experiences a downturn, doesn't do it all at once. It takes you know, different speeds, different variations, all sorts of gradation in, in between. And so what we saw in 2018 was, Europe and Japan went into the downturn first. It took a, you know, another few months further along before the U.S. joined them. And in between that period, everybody was, oh, the U.S. is fine. The U.S. is doing great. The U.S. is, is accelerating. This is a boom, all that stuff. The U.S. is going to decouple from all this, you know, this, mysteriously, uh, this, this mysterious downturn that shows up in 2018. The United States economy will be immune from it because it's so awesome. 
and decoupling, of course, as it has ever since 2008, always proves to be nothing more than a fantasy. And eventually, the world economy does resynchronize again in whichever direction it's going. Let's put some numbers to it, Jeff. We're going to show the PMI scores on a graph now, a historic PMIs for the United States, and that'll help people uh, put some context regarding that the numbers don't always what they mean, don't always mean what you think they mean. If they're at near-term highs or cycle highs, that doesn't mean things are fantastic. And we'll show that on a graph. But yes, the idea is Japan's PMI shrink when people are expecting it to increase, and Europe's PMI is in the 40s. Meanwhile, we've got the US PMIs heading towards 60. That's decoupling, and it's courtesy of the technocrats in the Federal Reserve telling us they're going to go well above 2% inflation. Or yeah, I, I think that's a really good point about PMIs too, is that, you know, when they were first introduced and constructed, the idea was that, you know, going back to the plucking model, unit roots and all the stuff that we've talked about before, that economies just simply go back to where they were. A recession is nothing more than a temporary interruption in what is otherwise a normal economic, pro you know, a, an unbroken, uh, unbroken trajectory or, or pattern of pot potential. So economies simply go and then they, you know, they get interrupted and they go back. And so the idea of a PMI in that situation is that, look, we're trying to gauge when these business cycles appear and then when they, you know, the recession or the trough part of the cycle ends. And so a PMI, all it says is that, okay, as you pointed out earlier, it's a diffusion index, which means more people are saying the economy is worsening than they're saying it's getting better. At least there are their individual situations in the economy. And so we assume that if more people are saying it's worsening than getting better, that's consistent with a normal recession process. And therefore, when that reverses and the PMI goes back above 50, when more people are saying things are getting better than getting worse, we assume that means that we're going to have a recovery. But that's not a valid assumption, as you can see, especially in the manufacturing sector, because we don't, there are periods in history where we, have, we are now seeing we don't get a recovery at all. But yet the PMIs are, get to be the same levels as they had been during periods where, which were recovery. So the PMI doesn't necessarily tell you about recovery. All it says is, are things getting better or getting worse? They don't say recovery, recession. They say, okay, getting worse, getting better. And so a PMI of, say, you know, high 50s into the 60s as we see recently may not, in fact, it probably is not the same thing as we've seen where PMIs have gotten up into the 60s in other periods in history where, where they did develop into something like economic growth because the underlying factors in the economy were very different than they are now. Just people may be thinking, well, that's not fair because if you're above 50, you're growing and that's good. You're moving forward. But it's what we also often talk about it's non-linear growth and if that doesn't actually make sense there are many kind of moving forwards there's sprinting striding sashaying and skipping that's good but there's also stumbling slithering staggering and slipping they're all moving forward but totally different results and i think yeah, we're in that latter category we don't care about absolute levels if if if, if you know the level of out manufacturing output is higher than it's ever been today that doesn't mean what, it's, what it sounds like it means. And it doesn't mean, any, it may not mean anything meaningful. It's not, it may not be a material uh, change in situation. What we care about is economic growth, which is a consistent, a consistent trend in growth, which lasts sustainably over time. And so on the chart that you just showed, which was manufacturing, but you can easily just use, you can use GDP or anything else. What should happen is it can continue, it, the uh, trend should continue moving higher and higher to the right and above at the same pace that it had always been historically. And so even if output is at a record high, but it's nowhere near that prior trend, you are in a contractionary situation. So what the PMI tells you is, is not that we're recovering. What the PMI tells you in that situation where we're, we're way off trend is that, well, right now it's not getting worse. That's all it's saying. It's not saying we're recovering. It's saying at this particular moment in time, the bad situation that we're in isn't getting worse right now. The problem is, as we've often talked about on the show, is that there's not enough money growth in the world. And one of the ultimate, pristine, most desired forms of money in the world is the U.S. Treasury bill. 
And that's what we're going to discuss in part three, because we're seeing some interesting developments in the U.S. Treasury bill market. Some entities are selling. Might that be a signal of reflation? 